On today's episode, we are getting into the latest space news, including NASA decides to keep SLS on the pad, the US tries to eliminate space junk, and Rocket Lab signs on to haul cargo for the military. There's lots to go over this week, so let's get going. This is the space race. No, you are not seeing things. NASA has apparently decided to keep SLS on the pad, for now anyway. Since the last scrubbed launch of Artemis 1, NASA has been waffling on whether or not they would have to wheel their gigantic rocket back to the VAB for more delicate repairs. In press conferences just after the September 3rd scrub, NASA engineers and administrators were all speaking about how difficult it would be to conduct repairs out in the humid Florida air, and that they would likely have to roll the space launch system back to the vehicle assembly line building for repairs, which would take weeks or maybe a month of work to finish. Well, it looks like NASA have opted to just go for repairing the rocket on its pad, risking moisture damage from the Florida air, and maybe the failure of their battery backups for the flight termination system. This is something that many people might not be familiar with. The flight termination system is like a self-destruct that is built into the rocket and will actually blow up the SLS in mid-air. The reason they have this is in case something goes catastrophically wrong with the flight control and the rocket starts moving wildly off course, like in the direction of where people live. It's an absolute worst case scenario, but if that were to happen, then the largest spaceship ever launched quickly becomes the largest ballistic missile ever launched. And that's bad. So the best thing to do is just to explode it into tiny pieces while it's still in the air which would obviously still rain down and be super dangerous, but significantly better than a 5 million pound hydrogen bomb. Earlier last week, we saw tents being erected on the side of SLS while techs tried to create a sterilized environment to effect repairs to the fuel system. But if it's this difficult and the risks are so high, why not do the same thing and pull it back to the VAB? Well, it's a tough call to make. The battery backup system for the self-destruct failsafe has now passed its certification expiry date. This means that even though the batteries are likely still functioning, NASA needs to reapply for their range certification before attempting another launch. As by the time SLS could be ready for another go, those batteries will definitely be in the danger zone in terms of their charge. If they can't get that certification, they'll have to wheel the SLS back to the bay anyway. So with all of that considered, this decision to stay on the pad seems just weird. But if we step back for a moment and remember what Artemis 1 is, then we start to get a better idea of what NASA is likely thinking. First, Artemis 1 is an uncrewed mission. There's no astronaut to harm and only data to gather. Second, and more importantly, Artemis 1 is meant for this. It's a test flight. It's meant to break and leak and fail and get patched and try over and over again. Even if Artemis 1 explodes on the pad or in the air, so long as no one is hurt, NASA gets vital information that will help the next missions. Staying on the pad lets them both keep the launch windows as tight as possible, and lets them test the new fittings with liquid hydrogen, something they can't do in the VAB. Imagine if they brought SLS back to the bay for weeks, fixed everything, put it back on the pad in October, and then a leak is found again. It's way better for them to test it here and now when they have access to the fuel that keeps aggravating those poor technicians. Reportedly, NASA is planning a tanking test this Friday or Saturday, if it goes well, we'll likely see another launch window open up at the end of this month, stretching into early October. NASA is really pushing the limits of their team and this rocket. If it makes it, there's still going to be a lot of work before we can trust SLS with a crew. Until then, let's hope this repair gamble pays off and we don't see the SLS go up in flames, both literally and figuratively. Anyone interested in spaceflight has, over the last couple of years, 
grown increasingly aware of our orbital trash problem. Old satellites, cargo fairings, ejected rocket stages, nuts, bolts, and just random debris have all been contributing to this growing problem. Kind of like the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, but with the possibility of grounding humanity for decades. Close calls with Kessler Syndrome have been happening more frequently, an event where debris clouds in space collide with other orbiting objects and grow until we have a shell of broken junk sealing in the Earth. And the United States is now attempting to curb at least their own part of the space trash problem. A recent push by several U.S. agencies and leaders, most notably Vice President Kamala Harris, has been developing new legislation which updates best practices for orbital operations. Some of the proposed regulations are updating laws that are more than 15 years old at this point. The Federal Communications Commission has the most drastic proposal at the moment. The U.S. authority is targeting satellite operators with a draft order which changes the rules for when a company has to plan for deorbiting their gear. Previously, the practice was to demand that companies operating in low Earth orbit had to at least attempt to deorbit their equipment within 25 years of the completion of its intended mission. The new rule will bring that down to 5. Obviously, this time limit can be extended if the satellite continues to be useful for a longer period. And effort is being made to set up orbital infrastructure for refueling that equipment to keep it going. In addition, the new rules seem to be targeting mostly low Earth orbit objects, as those represent the most risk to space operations. NASA's Orbital Debris Program Office, which finds and tracks orbital objects, countered that this move would only result in about a 10% decrease in debris over the next 200 years. And while they're right that this isn't statistically significant, the FCC program isn't the only program being considered to help mitigate orbital recklessness. In addition to the FCC updates, the Federal Aviation Administration and the National Transportation Safety Board have recently signed an agreement to update a 22-year-old setup for their roles and responsibilities when investigating mishaps, specifically those that involve fatalities or serious injuries to people and property outside of the bounds of a launch site. Polly Trottenberg, Deputy Secretary of Transportation, remarked that so far, the commercial space industry has a great safety record with no public death or injury. But that doesn't mean we should be waiting for the worst to happen to sharpen safety procedures, especially when they are over two decades old. The move to clean low Earth orbit and keep a closer eye on commercial space traffic makes a lot of sense when you think of even just the mega constellations going up recently. They are a big reason the FCC is updating its rules. Starlink alone has grown to over 3,000 active satellites, with plans for over 12,000 additional units to join them. These numbers have observatories worried about the effect that this will have on astronomy, including the search for dangerous asteroids. A 2020 ESO study found that wide-field telescopes are already being affected by the small number of Starlink satellites currently in orbit. The U.S. National Science Foundation's Vera C. Rubit Observatory, which looks for potentially dangerous asteroids, has predicted that if companies like SpaceX and Amazon continue with their plans to put up large constellations of satellites, they could see between 30 and 50% of their exposures ruined by passing equipment. SpaceX, to their credit, have already started designing their satellites to mitigate the reflectivity. But can we guarantee every other company will? Starlink satellites can maneuver to avoid dangerous situations, but can we be sure Amazon's Kuiper satellites will? Most of this fresh push for orbital safety comes on the heels of Russia's badly thought out 2021 satellite missile test. The ball of debris it produced forced astronauts aboard the ISS to seek shelter more than once and was the largest threat of an actual Kessler Syndrome event to date. This event served as a wake-up call to the world. 
Condemnations of Russia's recklessness came from every corner of the space industry, and politicians like VP Harris have been using this event to galvanize organizations across the globe, calling for more care in how we conduct ourselves in orbit. As more and more companies get certified, and companies like SpaceX prove the usefulness of mega constellations, we are going to see our skies get dangerously crowded. It's well past time to review and update our old safety regulations before someone gets hurt. The US military has a creative idea for getting their cargo around the world, a method which is cheaper, faster, and much more environmentally friendly than just flying material from base to base with planes. They are going to use rockets. The Cooperative Research and Development Agreement, or CRADA, is run by U.S. Transportation Command, the military organization that manages all of the global logistics for the U.S. Armed Forces. The command has decided that the quickest route to anywhere else in the world is through space, and they've signed on a couple of companies to help. The usual suspects are involved with this rocket cargo project already, so it's unsurprising that SpaceX and Blue Origin have signed on. But the command isn't stopping with the big boys. On September 7th, Rocket Lab signed up to use their Electron and future Neutron rockets to help out. Sierra's Space Dream Chaser space plane was signed on the very next day, giving the military a variety of reusable, proven and unproven vehicles to work with. At the moment, Neutron and Dream Chaser are both being observed and assessed as their development continues, but investment in new platforms is part of the project. Really, the rocket cargo project is about moving on from conventional aircrafts. You can only move so quickly with large cargo payloads if you are constrained to flying in atmosphere. With point-to-point -point suborbital flights, the military can shave hours off the time it takes to get equipment and supplies anywhere on the planet. And that's just the beginning, as this agreement reportedly has provisions for testing possible applications of orbital cargo depots as well, storing cargo in space for fast and easy retrieval during emergencies. It really sounds like something out of a Marvel movie. This sort of program is a logical next step to how we handle logistics in general not just for the military. As we grow as a species, we will always need to leverage new methods of doing things we've had trouble with in the past. Add to that the dire need to cut out massively polluting conventional aircrafts within the next decade, and this move just makes sense. Hopefully, it won't be too long before this program proves the utility of using rockets to hop cargo around the world, and this method starts being adopted in other industries. Imagine a hurricane hitting a city, and instead of waiting double-digit hours for a plane, we could shoot aid packages from orbit as soon as the storm broke. Rockets to the rescue. It's got a nice ring to it. Meet us back here every week for more updates on everything aerospace industry and interstellar exploration related. Make sure to give the video a thumbs up today if you liked it. That really helps us out for real. And subscribe to the Space Race for more videos just like this. We do one long form essay and one news update every week. And if you'd like more, we've got two more on the screen for you right now.